It is time for my good bu- my good buddy, the great Chuck Cooperstein, voice of the Mavs, joining us here on 105.3 The Fan. And, and what did the uh, what did the Galloway intro used to be? Coop, Coop in the loop, in the loop on, on the, the loose. loose. <laughs> morning, Coop. Morning, bo- morning, boys. How are you? Good morning. Doing well. I should be getting ready for a game six, but um, that is not in the cards. Uh, no, no, the you know either game two or game three, but for me it was game two. That that's the game that they will look back and certainly rue the moment. Uh, they knew they had to win at least once in Boston, and that was the game to go get because the Celtics basically were begging them to win that game, and they just weren't good enough to win it. Did, did you come away from the series then thinking that Boston was clearly the better team, or did the, like like you just kind of said the Mavs? had their chance and they, they did they didn't take advantage of the chance that they had. I think Boston was definitely better. Uh I don't think it was necessarily, you know, as dominant as it's uh, being made out nationally. Look, there there were two home blowouts for the Celtics. There was one home blowout for the Mavericks and there were two swing games uh you know at either place, both of which went Boston's way. Uh that again very easily could have gone the Mavericks way. So I mean, to me, I mean, I always thought it was going to be at least a six-game series uh, and even more so probably a seven-game series. But, hey, that's what happens. Boston, Boston is 80-21. and 21. Uh, You know, it's one of the great seasons uh, in the modern NBA. Uh, and, you know, with a, just all their metrics are such that suggest that they are not just a worthy champion, but even a historic champion. So, you know, kudos, kudos to them. Mavericks shouldn't feel bad that – uh, you know, that it's over, you know, be be happy for what you had, right? And what they had was an incredible run. Uh, and really starting from March 7th, not even just through the playoffs, but, you know, go back to March 7th and you, you look and you see what they did in that time and you see the possibilities. And that's what's really cool because, you know, you look at the Celtics and ultimately that was a team that was nearly a decade in the making. And it still took a couple of very deft, off-season moves by Brad Stevens to bring in both Porzingis and Drew Holiday uh, to be able to seal the deal for them. Coop, do you think the Mavericks look at this like you just said there? I, I agree. I think it was closer than it's been made out nationally because when you look at a lot of the peripheral statistics for the team over the course of that five-game series for Boston, Boston was not playing nearly as efficiently or as well as they has, you know had been shown to do at a historic pace before that. Do you think Dallas is coming away from the series? Luca, Kyrie, Jason, can people like that? Do you think they're coming away going, man, we we missed an opportunity here because we we really contained them offensively in a way that other teams hadn't been able to? Yes. Uh, look, if you had told me before the start of the series that the Celtics would never score more than 107 points in any game and and won the series, I would have been stunned. Would absolutely have been stunned because there was no way that you could tell me that any team that had Luka, even in a somewhat compromised state, and Kyrie would not be able to score. And, in fact, could not score 100 points in all four of their losses. Mm. Never never was on the bingo card here, kids. Nope. Uh, so, um, you know, I think if nothing else, uh, the great thing about the playoffs and the finals in particular is, number one, it shows the flaws of your team. And it ultimately shows what you need to work on in order to get to the ultimate goal. And I think it's it's pretty clear here uh, what the Mavericks need, uh, and not that they're going to be able to achieve it. But uh, you know, the idea of having a third ball handling guard who can really create his own shot, um, kind of like what they had two years ago with Spencer Dinwiddie when when Dinwiddie played the best that he's ever played in his life. Uh, you know, I don't know that Dante Exum is that player, uh, even though there are things that he does really well offensively that help them. But, I mean, I think you definitely need that type of player so that Luka and Kyrie uh, can't be uh, focused upon to the point that they were and it completely bogged down the entire offense. So, uh, to, to me, that's that was the thing that came, most came out of the series. Um, you know, it's, it's what your weaknesses are and, and how do you address it at the highest level. It may not necessarily matter in February, but it could very well matter in May and June. Talking with Chuck Cooperstein, the radio voice of the Dallas Mavericks here on 105 Through the Fan. Uh, Coop, there was a lot made, of course, obviously about the return of Kyrie to Boston and, and the atmosphere there. 
was obviously a very loud and intense atmosphere, but this was something we had asked Mike Breen last week, and I was curious for your take on it. Was it really a, a – did you feel like it was a hostile environment for Kyrie, or did you feel like it was a, a intense environment, but it was no different than just an intense playoff environment the way playoff environments tend to be? Oh, no, it was hostile. It was definitely hostile. Um, I, I've never – the only time I've ever seen anything – uh, really addressed to one player the way this was, was when Kiki Vandeway back in the day used to come to the uh, to Reunion Arena after you know the, he rejected playing for the Mavericks. Uh, you know, wound up playing with Denver, was a great player, and every time he touched the ball, at least certainly in the early years, it, it, uh, as it moved on, it kind of became comical because everybody knew what the drill was. Uh, but in the crucible of the finals, uh, it, it was real, and it, not just in the building. Look, it's it's all over town. I mean, when you're selling T-shirts mm. that say Kyrie sucks, I mean, it's real. I mean, no, I don't know that anybody literally has had to go through that. Coop, was this a bad matchup physically for Kyrie? Like, were, were defensively, were they too strong, too big? Was it just a bad matchup for him? In some ways, yes. In some ways, look, Kyrie just missed shots. Yeah. Man, he just missed shots that he normally makes. Uh, but, look, there's a reason why Drew Holiday and Derek White were second-team All-NBA defensive players. They, they showed it. Their, their length and their strength uh, and, their, uh, and, and, again, just the ability uh, of the Celtics. I think, you know, they talk about how they didn't switch. Celtics did a little more switching in this series, I think, than they, than they did previously. Uh, but all of them have the ability to guard. And... Uh, you know, Kyrie couldn't quite get to the rim as easily as he could and did in some other series. In a lot of ways, this was like the Oklahoma City series for Kyrie, where, he, you know, the length of Oklahoma City, not necessarily strength, but the length really bothered him. Um, you know, in the other two series against the Clippers and, and Minnesota, it really didn't. Um, but give full credit, hey, Derek White, how did the Spurs give him up? I mean, seriously, yeah, I mean, yeah. that's exactly that's exactly the guard they need to play with Wembenyama, right? I, mm. How did how did they do that? And you know, look, you you know how Holiday wound up there. I mean, it's and it just blame Milwaukee for that. I mean, what would what were they thinking? Why did they think that bringing in Damian Lillard to replace Drew Holiday would work? You know, there's a reason why Drew Holiday is. Uh, now won two championships, and he's going to be on two Olympic teams. He's one of those guys that simply wins. He does whatever you need him to do for your team to win. Coop, you know, this was obviously a, a big part of the the consolation, I guess, a lot of people nationally seem to be trying to give the Mavericks was, hey, you know what? This is just the beginning. Luka's going to be back here. The, this, You know, the Mavericks will get back here. He's He's got this in his future. And it reminds me back a little bit to – it felt like there was similar discussion about Devin Booker when the Suns lost. And since then, they've had trouble. How does – what what needs to occur this offseason, do you think, for the Mavericks to ensure they do get back there and that this isn't a defeating moment that prevents them from progressing? Well, first off, there's nothing that ensures anything, okay? Uh, look at the Western Conference. I mean, look at the Western Conference and the quality of those teams. Uh, number one, that made the playoffs – uh, number two of those teams, how many of them went through injuries uh, during the playoffs, and then look at teams like Houston and San Antonio that and that you know are going to get better. I mean, you know Wembenyama is going to get better, and they've got two picks in the top eight of the draft. I mean, they're definitely building something, uh, and Houston is definitely building something and building a culture with Ime Udoka coaching them. They were far better this year than they were last year. And Utah, if uh, they would ever stop – letting go of the rope midway through the season. I mean, they, they, were, they are a highly competent team. Every game in the West, you play 52 games in the West, and really other than your games that you were playing against Portland, which also has two first-round picks this year, uh, you know, those games are wars. Uh, and it does take a lot out of you, let alone what, what happens when you get to the playoffs where everything is matchup dependent. So um, there's nothing that ensures it. But, you know, the fact that, you, you know, you hope that Luka – uh, you know, continues to improve. It can be, uh, frankly, a little more consistent with his shooting. His three-point shooting cr clearly went awry at the end of the series, even though he had his best season ever shooting threes and shooting free throws. Um, 
you know, hopefully he can, you know, stay in the shape that he was in really for the first two thirds of the season. Uh, the fact that he was hurt as much as he was, I, I have to imagine affected, you know, his workout schedule and, and just, you know, keeping, uh, keeping himself uh, in, in the manner that he was early in the year. I think that was probably a little bit hard for him. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's 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 not like this team needs an entire overhaul. As, as I mentioned, they, they need a third ball handler. Uh, they can use probably somebody, you know, bigger who can stretch the floor uh, as as Lively and, uh, and Gafford really are rollers. I mean, we saw Lively make that three in game four, and he may eventually get to that point. But uh, I don't know that he's necessarily going to be there next year to where that's a reliable part of his offense. I mean, I just don't see him standing out there and taking three three pointers a game next year. But I do think that it's something that he will ultimately work on. And by the time he's 24, and let's remember, he's just uh, like 20 years and 125 days old, uh, he'll get there. Uh, so there's there's not necessarily a lot. There certainly are things that can be improved upon, but the road next year is not going to be any less difficult than it was this year. Coop, do we have any idea? Because if you- Cuba, there's a report that Cuban's role is now completely changed from last year. Do we have any idea the new ownership, like how they want to approach spending and stuff in the off season? Any kind of knowledge of that? Um, I, I think we we don't know much. You know, I know that uh, they held a news briefing on Friday of Game 4, which was a very odd time in my eye t- for them to do that, maybe because they knew everybody else would be, everybody else's attention would be focused elsewhere. But, um, I mean, I, I haven't seen anything internally as far as, you know, staff and whatnot that would prevent them and prevent this group from spending whatever they feel they need to spend in order to win. And what they have done, it appears, is put their faith in Nico Harrison. And given what Nico's done, <laughs> why wouldn't you put your faith in him? He's done a mm-hmm. phenomenal job yeah, yes. in, in, in building this thing and being creative. And let's face it, uh, you know, the Mavericks, you know, there have been a, a lot of times in these three years where you're wondering, like, how are they going to do this and w- what, what's going to happen? And, you know, all of a sudden you see stuff happening that, uh, frankly, didn't always happen in the past. So, um, you know, I think that they're, they pretty much have put their faith in Nico to uh, – to uh, you know, build the team as he sees the team, <clears throat> and at least you know if it means you know spending a little more money, uh, you know I think they're willing to do that. You know, let, let's see if they're willing to go into the second apron. I don't know if that's your question or not. Uh, I, I don't know that they're necessarily willing to do that right now, and nor do I think that they really have to go do that right now. Mm-hmm. But um, I, I think I think the, the franchise is in a pretty good place. 66 days till college football, right around the corner. 66 days to college football, and believe it or not, like only about like 110 days until like the Mavericks play a preseason game again. (laughs) Short off season for Luca, and then the Olympics. uh, Which yeah, and 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 that's and and that's another thing too. You know, is this going to be the summer that Luca finally? you know, decides that he's not going to play as much as he wants to play and his desire to play for his national team and win medals for his national team. It, it trumps just about everything or certainly stands alongside uh, trying to win an NBA championship for the Mavericks. Um, you, you know how much he loves it. And I'm a, and, and generally speaking, I'm a fan of playing in the summertime. I, I think it's, it's great. And I think, you know, especially with that type of competition, it forces you to be in really good shape, but, Listen, he took a beating. He yeah. took a beating, uh, not just from April 21st to June 17th, but you know, even leading into the second half of the season. Uh, there's a lot that went on here, and you know, kudos to the Mavericks training staff for basically being able to get him out there every night and do what he did. But uh, I have to believe that if it doesn't happen this summer, uh, it'll it will never happen. I mean, mm-hmm. he, there's a qualifying tournament uh, in Greece. Uh, on July from July 2nd through the 7th, it's a killer draw. They may not make in any way, uh, even if he were there. That's, that's where you know, obviously Greece uh, is going to be the favorite to get there, and Giannis is going to play. Uh, so we'll we'll see. But um, a, a little rest, a little R and R could could do him a whole lot of good. Yes, it could. Hey, brother, we appreciate it, man. Thanks so much. Take care, guys. All right, Chuck Cooperstein. Enjoy the off season. 